Welcome to the Business Learning Lounge. Um, great to be back again chatting about important topics in organizations and in important topics for leaders. So today's podcast, we're going to focus on the balance between um, two key aspects in our organizations, the balance between engagement and accountability. Now, these two are often talked about separately, but I want to talk about them as, as a united piece because we want people to be super engaged in our organization, but we also want them to be accountable to what the organization needs them to do. So let's have a bit of a chat about the two aspects, and I'm going to weave them through so that you really understand that they're two parts of the same thing and really understanding that actually true engagement is not only people feeling motivated to work for your organization, but being motivated to deliver the outcomes your organization requires. So we'll pick up both of the aspects, but let's start with motivation and engagement. There's lots of research out there around motivation and engagement. It's a a well-researched area. Um, And a lot of the early theories of motivation um, in particular, uh, engagement came a bit later, but the early theories around around motivation really focused on Do we have a hierarchy of needs and what are the base needs that need to be met in order for us to to feel self-actualized or to feel good about being in an organization? Um, Now, with that said, those theories have helped us to understand that people, if base level needs are not met in our organizations, that people are not going to be motivated. So if we don't pay people enough, that's not going to bring about a level of of motivation. While pay is more of a demotivator than a motivator, it definitely is a baseline. So, you know, if we at, if we get our pay right and it's equitable and people feel like they're paid for the job that they're doing, um, then they are going to put their effort in. Um, so reality is that when we start to look at motivation, we do need to meet some of those base levels. Now, um, there's an interesting piece of research that's been going on for 75 years in the US. And that piece of research looks at what what is important for life satisfaction, not just work satisfaction, but life satisfaction. And the single most important thing for life satisfaction is good connection. Now, when we start to talk about organizations, if you take Maslow's hierarchy of needs, belonging is one of the key base levels of um, motivation. So we need to, in a workplace, provide the opportunity for connection. Um, Now, that's interesting in today's world. If you look at remote working um, and hybrid working arrangements, Where is the connection made? So when we talk about motivation and engagement at the moment, it's actually quite complex and we can't just use strategies that we used in the past. We need to think about new and fresh strategies. And what we're seeing now is that organizations are actually starting to say, well, you need to come back to work for those connection points. Even if you're working remotely, you need to make sure that you have enough touch points. And we've seen in the Gallup research, the Gallup research actually says that two to three days is a minimum to maintain engagement. Um, So having people working fully remotely is a challenge for motivation and engagement. Um, And it's a challenge that we still need to meet because we do still have people working fully remotely. But how are you going to make sure that they're motivated and engaged? Um, Interestingly, I was reading just an article just yesterday um, that business leaders are starting to say, if you're in a Zoom meeting, you have to have your camera on. So you can't just switch it off and be present on the meeting. That's part of that connection piece. How are we connecting with each other? Connection matters for satisfaction, motivation, 
engagement. It matters in all of those areas. So those early um, researchers that said, you know, that there are some base level needs, that's still applicable. Then there's a whole lot of research around um, our how we process our motivation and engagement. And that's that research looks at, you know, in my head, if I decide that I need to be the CEO in two years' time, I'm not going to stay motivated if I don't reach that goal in the timelines that I've set for myself. So we do need to actually manage people's internal expectations. Otherwise, their motivation will drop. Those internal processing um, abilities um, are can be managed by individuals, but if the individual's not managing those, then we need to help them to actually articulate what those are and and help them to understand how the organisation can deliver that. I think particularly of the the Gen Zs and every new generation coming into the workforce, they always we always have high expectations of what we're going to achieve, um, the salaries we're going to make, and all of those sorts of things. So when we start to talk about um, motivation, if I come in with a belief that I'm going to be promoted really quickly, that's going to give me challenges because I might not get promoted as quickly as I'd like. So those younger generations, we do have to help them to realign their expectations to what's going on in the world around them. I have a a Gen Z who who is nearly nearly 20 um, and his expectations of work and employment are way out of alignment with what reality will be for him. And in fact, he's just got his first job, uh, his first kind of um, serious job, I would say. And he's suddenly realizing that he's not earning as much as he'd like to. Um, So reality is that we do have to realign those expectations um, so that we can help people to manage their motivation. We don't want our Gen Zs demotivated because they don't achieve expectations that aren't um, sustainable. So those internal processes, processing um, theories do help us to understand the internal dialogue that goes on for certain generations and and for all of us, yeah? If I go to an organization, join an organization, and I have an expectation of something and it's not met, then that's going to demotivate me. I think of an organization just recently that I was working with and they had had a Christmas party and they have a Christmas party every year. But this last year, they changed the location and everyone was super grumpy about it. Um, Something that should have been a motivator for people, positive um, event, just because of a change of location had become a demotivator. So we do need to think about um, those internal processing aspects that affect motivation and engagement and work with our people to actually keep their motivation levels up. The last area uh, of of research, well, the biggest, the third biggest chunk of of research, looks at how certain jobs, um, if they don't have enough interest in them, can become demotivating. So, job content theories really theorize around, you know, if you've got boring jobs, it's going to be hard to keep people motivated. And we want to keep people motivated, even in boring jobs. We want to keep people energized and motivated and engaged. Um, So, super important that we take cognizance of all of those things. Now, let's forget about the theories for a moment and let's talk pragmatically. So how do I understand what motivates my people? In reality, the only way you're ever going to know what motivates your people is to have a conversation. And to have a conversation on a relatively regular basis because people's motivations do change over time and over circumstances. So one day someone might be motivated um, by a new project But tomorrow they might be motivated by a pay increase, yeah? 
Or the next day they might be motivated by being able to work in a collaborative team. So we need to actually understand people's motivation over time and energize them to actually help to focus on what motivates them. There is there is a requirement for people to work on their own motivation. Um, and if you've listened to our podcast on culture and building healthy cultures, building resilience and emotional intelligence is a part of that, as it is a part of motivation and engagement. People need to understand their own motivators and really ask the questions of themselves. But if you're in a leadership role, your job is really to understand what motivates your team. And each of your team members will be motivated by different things. So it's super important to actually ask those questions and ask them on a regular basis. It does help if you do diagnostics, um, so understanding people's personalities, because different personalities are motivated by different things. Um, we use uh, we use the print profile a lot, which looks at motivators. We use Myers-Briggs, a whole range of tools out there to actually understand people's preferences from their personality perspective. But you can do that just by asking them. So you don't have to use diagnostics, but they do help to understand the person better. The more you understand your people, the more you're able to motivate and engage them. All right, so let's um, talk about the combination of motivation and engagement and accountability. Now, it's not okay to just have employees who are super engaged or motivated, but they're not doing the job. So we need to actually grow our people to understand that part of engagement and motivation is actually them doing the work that the organization needs them to do, not just doing their own little pet projects or, you know, tipping up to work um, when, when they feel like it. That's part of what we need to build. And that's why these two are so closely aligned. And as leaders, we need to, in order to keep people both motivated and engaged and accountable, we need to both support them and challenge them. And when, we, when you think about that balance, it's a really fine balance. You want to challenge people to deliver what the organization wants, but you want to support them to be engaged and, and motivated. And that balancing act is a hugely challenging one. We want to support people um, and, and give them the health and well-being that they need to do their job, but we do need to challenge them to do the work that they need to do. And when you look at at um, sports people, um, they're a great example of this. They have to do the work. They have to do the training and the the um, constant discipline about their sport practice. But they need the rest as well. And they need the support of their coaches and, and their psychologists. So we need to be doing both. If we want to keep up our employees positive and engaged and motivated, we need to do both of those because we need them to do the work that the organization needs from them. Now, there are a whole lot of strategies that play into both of these aspects. And I want to talk about the key ones that sit under these two important aspects of organizational lives, of organizational life. The first, the first thing that we need to do if we're going to get this balance between supporting and challenge and getting people actually delivering what the organization needs, but also um, supported for their well-being and their health and their development, if we're going to get those two in balance, we have to get really good at setting key performance indicators or areas of focus for work. And that, that piece of work needs to be balanced with both what the person is doing and how they deliver it. So it needs to incorporate, let's say, you know, they've got a major project they're working on. It needs to include that project, but it also needs to include the developmental areas that they need to develop develop in to grow their competence to be really effective in how they do that work. We really don't want employees who are fantastic at the doing of their job 
but or annoying everyone in the organization or bullying people unnecessarily. Yeah, we want to have them able to do their job, but also interact with other people in the organization successfully. But we also don't want people who are just wandering around, making mates and being friendly with everyone and not doing their job. So there's a balance between those. And we need to get that balance right when we're setting key performance areas, because we need to have the, the how we do things aligned with the what. For a lot of organizations, you will have values and values generally tend to be the how people do things. The what people do it normally comes from your strategy and your key performance indicators, but you do need to get really good balance between those two. That is the starting point of the combination of engagement and motivation aligned with accountability. You cannot get both of those without good KPIs in place. Um, now, key performance issue uh, uh, indicators, you can call them whatever you like. It doesn't really matter. Um, but you need to have those in place to develop the starting point of good engagement and motivation um, and accountability. And also what that allows you to do as a leader is you can step away once you've set those and agreed them with the person and you've worked on them together, you can step away and let them get on with their job and not have to micromanage them or, or be um, integrally involved in their day to day. So it really does allow you to do both pieces and is an important aspect in our ability to um, really be able to deliver engagement and accountability. The second aspect that you need to develop um, and really get good at as a leader, if you're going to engage people and keep them accountability, keep them accountable, is you need to develop good feedback skills. Now, most of us don't come into leadership with the ability to give good feedback. So I would encourage you um, to get some help with this area if you're not good at it. But you need to get good at giving feedback, both in the positive and in the constructive, so that you can help your people to grow. Feedback is not around telling people they're wrong. It's about actually helping them to grow. It's helping them to grow and to develop their capability and to get better at what they do. None of us are perfect. None of us get everything right all of the time. But our job as leaders is to help our people to grow into their roles, to develop their skills, to open up their blind spots and to help them to be the best that they can be. I don't believe as a leader, if you're not giving enough feedback, that you are leading effectively. Now, generally, we would say if you've got a team of seven or eight, um, which start the spans of control, say, is a reasonable sized team. If you've got seven or eight in your team, you should be giving 20 to 30 pieces of feedback across those seven or eight people every week. Um, now, that should be fairly easy. Um, that's only about one minute of feedback um, for each person. So if you say, let's say you're giving 20 pieces of feedback, that's 20 minutes. So we do need to actually invest in putting time and effort into giving feedback. Really important skill to develop. And I, as I said earlier, I encourage you, if you don't have good skills of feedback, go and develop them. There's lots of strategies for giving good feedback. I do, in, in our leadership programs, we do make sure that we train people in how to give feedback because there is an art to giving effective feedback. So I do encourage you to go and find out how to give feedback effectively and having some sort of structure around the feedback that you, get, that you provide to people is important. Now, the next area that is um, really important in terms of both engagement and accountability is that as a leader, you need to develop the skills of coaching. Um, a lot's been said about coaching 
Um, in some of my podcasts, I've talked about external coaching. But as a leader in your organization, you should be coaching your people on a regular basis. Probably not every week, but you should be coaching them on a fairly regular basis. If you're doing, you know, regular one-on-one catch-ups with them, then this just becomes a natural part of your regular catch-up. Um, there's, again, there's lots of models and tools out there that you can use, but actually developing the capability to understand that every opportunity is an opportunity to coach someone is super important. So when someone comes into your office and says, hey, boss, how do I do this? Instead of going, this is how you do it, go, well, how would you go about doing it? That's a coaching moment. That's a moment where you can actually offer them some guidance by just asking a question rather than giving them a solution. So we need to get into a mindset of coaching where we're actually giving people the opportunity to solve their own issues. If we don't do that, then we're going to get ourselves into a position where we're constantly having to baby people, um, give them the answers all the time. So you want to get to a position where you're teaching people to fish rather than giving them a fish, if you think about that analogy. Now, as I said, there's lots of models and tools out there. The one that I like the most and use the most um, in the leadership programs that we run um, is the Grow Coaching Model, which comes from John Whitmore. Now, John developed the Grow Coaching Model out of Um, his experience of looking at good sports coaches, not team sports coaches, but individual sports coaches um, who coach tennis players and um, golf players. And he developed his grow model to really align with best practice. And the grow models also focused on the whole the whole premise of positive psychology. So if you focus on something positive and get people focused on something positive, they're more likely to move towards that. So again, I would encourage you to go research, find a model that works for you. But if you are interested, the GROW model is a fantastic model. And John John's book is um, a very clear articulation of that. Now, when we talk about coaching, coaching sometimes does need to be external. So for some of your people, particularly, you know, if you've got leaders who maybe are in a relatively senior role, um, it is worth getting external coaching for them because it gives them an opportunity to stretch themselves outside of their organization. Um, but generally, as leaders, we should be building our capacity to coach. I also think that, you know, mentoring programs help in this area as well. So don't limit yourself just to coaching, mentoring programs within the organization, mentoring programs outside. But this is a key area for enhancing engagement and accountability because when you're coaching someone you're still holding them accountable but you're actually supporting them to fix their own issues so it's a great tool for getting that balance between the support and um and the challenge so that balance is is really um brought into play in coaching because we are you know At the end of it, we are asking people to do something about the coaching, but we're also supporting them through that developmental aspect of coaching. So I do encourage you to think about how you how you um, are doing in terms of coaching your people that work for you. The next area from a, a engagement and an accountability perspective is managing performance. Now, I always say to people that it's not just about managing poor performance, it's about effective managing of performance on an ongoing basis. And then, yes, sometimes you have to tip over into performance management, but that should be less often than just simply um, managing of performance. If you're effectively managing performance, you will be having one-on-one sessions with your people on a regular basis. 
if you're effectively managing performance, you will be coaching them. You will be giving them training and development when they need to have it. You will be um, having team meetings where they're growing in terms of their, their capacity to work collaboratively with other people. If you are managing performance, you will be giving people feedback on a regular basis. If you're managing performance effectively, you will be doing good performance reviews twice a year. Um, at minimum twice a year. I find with, with my team, we tend to do it once a quarter because it just keeps us up to date with where things are going. And we make sure that we're aligned with where we said we were going to be. Also, the pace at which things are moving organizationally in today's world means that if you're not doing at least um, every six months, you're probably already out of date because things are moving so quickly. KPIs should be shifting if our business needs us to shift. Um, we need to be agile in this space. So managing of performance requires all of those good things. It's not just about tipping up to work and hoping your people are getting done what they need to do and checking things off once in a while. It's actually a daily routine. Um, now, as as leaders, we are responsible for that managing of performance, but we're also responsible when someone keeps not performing and we've tried our, our best to manage their performance, then we need to tip over into that performance management piece. Generally speaking, we would only see about 10% of people end up at some stage in a performance management situation. And even, even that 10% is much smaller that have to be um, performance managed out, normally about 1%. Um, but if you get good at the managing of performance up front, then you have less to do around the performance management later on. So be aware if you get better at the managing of performance, you'll have less in the performance management space. So when we, when we look at that, that's one whole piece. We're managing performance, managing performance, and then if it doesn't stay healthy and good, we're then performance managing. Don't see them as separate entities because the performance management end, everyone gets nervous about. But if you've done good managing of performance, then the performance management is easier. Look, I'm not saying it's easy because it's not. Um, anyone who's been who's taken a, an employee through performance management will know that that's not easy. But reality is that part of our job in engaging and holding people accountable is dealing with people when they don't meet our expectations at work. And it is a requirement, particularly in terms of if you want the rest of your team to stay engaged, because if you don't manage that one poor performer, that disengages the rest of your team. So when we talk about accountability and engagement, we can't ignore those and we do have to deal with them. Now, when, when we talk about that performance management end, I do recognize that that is a challenge because it is hard to do and it's challenging to do it. And I would encourage you, if you do ever have to really go into that performance management end, make sure that you are getting the support you need through that. So have a coach or a mentor or someone who's just sitting alongside you, a colleague who can support you through that. Because as, as um, legislation has started to impact more and more into this area, what we're seeing is that the minute you start to performance manage as a leader, you do get some level of pushback. Often nowadays as leaders, you'll be called a bully um, or bosses because you're not treating me nicely or you're micromanaging me or anything like that. So you need support to manage effectively through that and hold your cool when people do um, go into attack mode. It's not you know, it's quite rational for them to get into attack mode because you are 
telling them they're not performing. So understand that it's quite rational for them to get into that space. Doesn't mean it's nice, doesn't mean it's easy, just means you do have to um, really understand that people people are feeling threatened when you start to do that. So get the support you need when you need to go that bottom end. I will say that in uh, my whole career in corporate life, I only actually ever went all the way through to perform final dismissal with one person. But, but I will say that I helped lots of people find new careers who maybe weren't suited to the jobs that they were in at the time. So it is important that we help people to find better opportunities. Just because someone's not functioning in your team doesn't mean that they won't be a great employee somewhere else. So it's really about being honest with people. Um, and it's a key part of engagement and accountability hugely important. The next thing that we need to be good at and really good at is actually recognizing performance, giving good recognition, both publicly and privately, not just that little bit of feedback that I've talked about already, the positive feedback, but I'm talking about real recognition for people. Um, If you organization doesn't have a recognition strategy, develop one yourself and your team, particularly if you're, if you're in a senior leadership role and you have the capacity to do that. Develop some sort of way of recognizing people and, and giving them feedback. Um, because if we can't recognize the good performers, how are we going to keep everyone motivated and engaged and accountable? The last area I want to touch on in terms of um, really keeping that accountability and engagement in balance is that we need to get good at handling team conflict, team dysfunction, behaviors that get in the way in teams. Because if we don't get good at that handling of conflict in our teams, what it does is it imbalances that accountability and that engagement. It drops the engagement and the team becomes dysfunctional and isn't holding themselves accountable. I'll give you an example. So I was working with a team um, that had I was called in because they'd gone to war. So two parts of the same team um, and they wouldn't talk to each other. So they're in one team, but they won't talk to each other. It was actually a finance team. So total at war with each other. Everything had to go up to the boss and down to the other team, up to the boss and down to the other team. And I was I was sent in to kind of try and work out what had happened and why it had got so dysfunctional. Um, And when we got to the bottom of it, it was actually two people who'd got into conflict um, about four years before. And by the time I came in, they both had their little posses who believed that they were both right. And so neither would talk to each other. They wouldn't even be seen um, walking past each other's pods because there was so much animosity. And what had happened um, to create that conflict is they'd done an office move and two people wanted the same desk. Yes, <laughs> that's the truth. Two people wanted the same desk and the boss had given it to one and not the other. But what had happened was that conflict had been shoved underneath the surface. The boss had gone, oh, let's, it's okay, they'll get on with it, it'll get over. No, it didn't get over. And yes, it got worse. And by the time it was four years later, it was absolute conflict. And unfortunately, in that situation, both of the individuals eventually left the team because basically they weren't prepared to face dealing with each other. And to bring that team together took a lot of work and a lot of time and effort. But by the time they came together, they actually realized that they could do the work with much less people than they'd had to build up around this dysfunction. And so they actually were better off. So understand that if we don't deal with conflict, it gets in the way of both accountability and engagement because the whole team in that situation was disengaged because they were pissed off at not being able to do what they needed to do. So when we talk about these two, engagement 
and accountability, we need to deal with conflict. And if you're not good at dealing with conflict and not good at handling it, I would encourage you as a leader to go and seek some help with that because it is really important that you're able to do it and able to handle conflict. It doesn't go away of its own volition, unfortunately. Um, And I would encourage you with conflict, always deal with it straight away. Don't let it go. Bring the two people in, talk about it, get it laid on the table, get some agreement around how things are going to move forward and help people to be more functional in the workplace. So as you can see, all of those strategies are important in maintaining engagement and in maintaining accountability. If we want to keep people engaged in today's workforce, we have to work at these things. We have to build that engagement and that accountability. To do that, we need good KPIs or key performance indicators in place. We need to be clear with people around what they're expected to do, but also how they're expected to do it. We need to be good at giving feedback to people on a regular basis on their performance and giving them positive feedback. We need to be good at managing performance. So from the starting aspect of having one-on-ones, working with people effectively, right to that performance management end where we're telling people that they're not doing a good job. We need to be able to coach our people and grow their capability and help them to be better at what they do. And we also need to deal with conflict in the workplace and recognize people when they're doing great work and and delivering great outcomes. So those are some key strategies that you can use to enhance both the engagement and the accountability. These two sit together. Don't separate them out because the minute you separate them out and you only have one and not the other, you've got an imbalance. We want to keep people balanced. We want to hold them accountable and challenge them. And we want to support them and build their engagement. So please go out and manage both of those effectively through those strategies that we've talked about. And thank you for joining us today for our podcast.